Oh no. Harry's Pub, convenient and good. All right, so um, hello again, everybody. Um, this is my first conference presentation ever, and I'm proud that it's at ShmooCon because I really love ShmooCon. Um, at the same time, I'm kind of wary of the fact that this is the first uh, ShmooCon with a ShmooBall launcher contest, so I don't know. I'd, so I'd really hard to make my slides good, but oh well. Anyway, um, so my name is Dan, and uh, this, this presentation is going to have to be a little bit quick because I thought I was going to have like a longer slot, like a 40-minute, 60-minute slot, and now I have a 20-minute slot. So this is going to be somewhat akin to a ShamWow commercial a little bit. So um, let's just dive right into it. Um, one thing I'd like to mention, since we're going through quick, um, no questions. If you want to uh, ask me questions, give me comments, suggestions, money, lacy undergarments, you can see me at the core security booth after the talk, and I'll be around the con. So. Um, just a quick disclaimer about this. Um, all the techniques that I'm uh, using here are demonstrated on web-based technologies, web servers and things like that. Uh, but they apply to more than just that. Anything that takes a, a file name and processes it uh, from user input um, on a Windows system has a possibility of being affected by this stuff. So just keep that in mind. Uh, also, if you figure out a way to, um, to use these techniques that isn't covered in my presentation, you win a bottle of beer. Come by the core security booth. Um, also, there's haiku on every slide. Read it if you get bored with the slides. So the big problem, the big problem here is that applications tend to do uh, string-based comparison of file paths and file names rather than actually checking the file system. Um, the, the problem with this is that uh, we, we, can we can reference one file with a bunch of different uh, names, and that's why Windows file pseudonyms, so fake names. Um, and any applications might not expect some of these strings because, well, I guess you'll see soon enough. Um, some of these are based on undocumented features. Some of it's just weird stuff. And some of it's you know, coming back to what usually bites Windows in the ass in terms of security is backwards compatibility. Um, so let's start out with that. 8.3 aliases. Now, what I mean by 8.3 aliases um, starts with the 8.3 format, which is eight characters, a period, and then three characters for a file extension. Uh, and that's the DOS file name format that has to match up to that. Uh, in modern Windows systems, if a file is created that does not match this format, an alternate name is also stored that can refer to the same file. Um, now, highly simplified, because for time reasons again, um, basically, you take the first six characters of the file name, add a tilde, add a digit to distinguish it from other, its other brethren, which sh share the first same six characters, and then, uh, trunk, and then uh, throw on the first three characters of the original file extension. Um, and that's an important part. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so why do you care? Because um, let's say your IDS is looking for the old PHP BB remote command execution in highlight.php, and it's looking for highlight.php specifically as a part of what the, what's bad. Um, but it's on the network, and we're not expecting it to actually go and check the file system of what it's supposed to be protecting. So we use the 8.3 alias for it. Goes right by, maybe. Maybe haven't, haven't, haven't confirmed this on any particular thing, but um, also uh, certain, certain files that you might be restricting, you may be, maybe you're doing string-based comparison on it. The 8.3 alias isn't going to match it, and we'll see that later, absolutely. Um, and also file type can be determ uh, is often determined by the user input. So in addition to doing string-based comparison, we're also trusting the user input to give us the file extension. And normally that seems like a safe assumption, but when we're truncating the file extension and you know in this alternate name, not so good anymore. Um, and more than that, this slide is a little complicated. I'm going to skip over a lot of this, but um, basically, in a short, in short, 
the set of long file names possible on Windows systems um, is a number which doesn't fit readily on a slide. So it's in scientific notation here. And the, short file, the, the, the set of short file names possible is much, much, much smaller. And um, when we know the file extension, the number of possible uh, 8.3 compatible names, which every file by default on a Windows system can be referred to with an 8.3 uh, name, um, we have about 110 quadrillion possibilities, which for a computer isn't too bad. So brute forcing becomes a lot easier if we're trying to enumerate file names that we don't know. Um, next thing I want to talk about is characters which, when put at the end of file names, are just silently discarded, just gone. Uh, if any of you have read uh, Team Ush.it's uh, PHP file system attack vectors paper, great paper, by the way, highly recommended, they talk about some of this stuff. Um, so in Windows API calls, periods and spaces at the end of file names, shh, completely gone. Just throw them out the window. And in, in the Windows shell, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's discarded as well. Double quotes, uh, in, and this is all, these are all in certain conditions. Um, double quotes, angle brackets. Um, if you have current directory markers, the dot slash or slash dot or whatever you have. Or you know if you have um, some directory and a double dot, these are all just soundly ignored. Um, I mean, some of these it makes sense, and some of these not quite so much. So all of these names, we, you know, file.txt, file.txt with a bunch of spa uh, spaces, periods, double quotes, angle brackets, whatever, all of these refer to the same exact file. Now, if you look at that and think about, well, how am I going to write a regular expression for this? You kind of want to kill yourself a little bit. So that said, let's move on. Um, but you know the different technique from the from uh, but but similar similar use. We're still breaking string-based comparison here. Um, now DOS special device files. You guys might be like, well, I know what those are, but so basically they're similar to uh, what you find in the slash dev slash namespace in under under your Unix you know in the Unix file system, um, and they allow file operations to be performed on devices. Um, but they have names like con and null and prn. Um, and you pro like I said, you probably already know about this, but here's some things that you probably didn't know. First, they exist everywhere. Everywhere. If you give a full path to anything and it ends with con, it's still going to refer to the console. Doesn't matter if you have access to the directory. Any as long as your path to con resolves all the way up to the point where you do, you do a slash con, even if it's a file, <laughs> you can use that as a sort of directory, and it's still valid. It'll still refer to the console. So that's interesting. Um, they can have any file extension you want. It's completely ignored. So con is the same as con.bat.php.conf. This is a long and arbitrary file extension. And some of you, I'm sure, are reading the last one there and thinking, wait, wait, a long string of uppercase A's. Where do I know that from? So. But you're exactly right, a buffer overflow. Um, if any of you have your laptops open, which I'm, I mean a schmook on, I'm sure some of you do, and you're running Windows, well, that's less likely, but go to the, go to the command prompt and type 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 space con dot and just throw a bunch of A's on there and see what happens. Um, so in this, in this scenario, a Windows application takes in a file name and verifies that it exists. Now, DOS special device files, they exist technically and they exist everywhere. Great. And, um, but they don't exist on the NTFS file system. But the program will probably assume that it does. So it probably assumes that it follows NTFS file system limitations, like maximum file name size. Um, so I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. Now, um, we can also control, like I mentioned before, we control, can control how the, you know, the, the device files are handled. So imagine that you, can, uh, you have a web server running on some machine that also has a, a serial modem attached to it or a Bluetooth dongle, which tends to use the, uh, the COM ports. Um, and you can communicate with that. So you request COM1.php and then start sending data to that serial port. What do you think happens? Anybody? 
Whoop, that was not what I wanted to do. Okay, so next thing I want to talk about is namespace prefixes. Um, again, I'm trying to, um, namespace prefixes are just um, things that you can proceed file paths with to sort of change what they're pointing to. Um, and you use this because the things you're pointing to are really devices or they don't exactly exist on the local file system or because they have names which violate, uh, uh, violate the, the normal restrictions. Um, interesting thing about this, you can violate a lot of the restrictions that you would normally encounter when trying to create uh, or work with files in general on a Windows system. You can exceed max path, so you can give a path that is longer than 260 characters. And um, how many people have seen code that uses max path as the size for a fixed size buffer? Anybody? Yeah, well, it's out there a lot. Um, so take that as you will. Um, some restricted characters can be used, so maybe you can slip some meta characters in there that normally wouldn't be in file names. So again, people writing filters are so, and, and, and you can also, and this is a fun, uh, it, this is really fun, you can use reserved base names. So you can create files named things like con and null and prn and all these things that normally defer, refer to devices. Um, but you have to proceed it with double whack, question mark, whack, and it has to be an absolute path. Um, so next we have uh, UNC paths, and the, the short version I'm sure you guys have all seen, uh, it's just referring to SMB shares. Uh, nothing terribly special, but we can actually add the minimal parsing prefix at the end of that, and uh, we can use it in the same way, but with SMB uh, files on SMB shares. Um, also, um, I want to talk about the na NT device namespace prefix, but uh, talking about it and describing what it is and why it's there, how it works, is probably probably would take about as long as this presentation has to go. So, I'm not going to do that. But suffice it to say, you can access a whole bunch of files, pretty much any file on your, compute, on your, on your Windows system using this, this namespace. Whether or not you actually have access to it and can work with it is a different story, but um, one, one interesting thing I wanted to point out, take a look at that second one. That, that points to the first hard disk volume, the first, uh, actually, sorry, the second starting from zero. Um, the second hard disk volume on the computer. Um, so we're able to access hard drive volumes uh, hard disk volumes using this, this prefix. And this looks completely different from what you would expect C colon slash to look like, but it might actually be identical. Funny thing is, you don't need a drive letter mapped to this volume in order to actually access it. So let's say you're running a machine with a, a, a recovery partition on it that doesn't have a drive letter access. You can look at all the files and play around with that using this prefix. So that's pretty neat. And uh, if you want to play with the, around with the, the, this, this namespace, you can get WinObj from uh, sysinternals. Um, this one is pretty obvious. If we can uh, trick a machine into taking an SMB share, um, and maybe it'll be looking for, um, you know, maybe it'll be looking for a normal, uh, a short UNC path. I mean, they, they both start with double whack, so it's a little bit unlikely that you get this through with long UNC, but I don't know. Maybe there's some scenario out there. But, we can, uh, where, where uh, an application would take a file name normally, uh, the application usually is not going to be handling the, the uh, retrieving the file. It's going to leave that up to the operating system. And so Windows will very happily go out and get a, a, a file on an SMB share, but the application just assumes it's a local file. Oops. So um, another neat thing. Um, just that uh, something I mentioned earlier, we can, we can um, you know, this is related, a, a lot of this stuff can be used for directory traversal because all of these paths um, theoretically point to C colon slash on the local machine, but they're all fairly different, as you can see. Um, I mean, I, again, they all start with double whack, but, you know, you have some, op you have some options here. Um, like I mentioned before, we have uh, the ability to exceed the max path restrictions, so we can, we can do some buffer overflows there. That's, that's pretty short. Um, now, imagine that you're a Windows system administrator, and somebody uses the minimal parsing prefix that I mentioned earlier to create a file named con on your system, and you discover this, and you go, what the hell is this? So you try to open it, and it doesn't work. Why? Because 
the applications are not trying to access it using the minimal parsing prefix. They're just opening up the file name, which results in opening up the console, which most of the time will either not work or cause the application to hang or something of that variety. But even Windows Explorer can't work with it. It, it, if you try to delete it using Windows Explorer, if you try to kill it the console, nothing happens. So you'll probably end up crying and pretending that some, one of your applications or the operating system itself put it there, and you just probably shouldn't touch it and leave it alone. So um, imagine using that in conjunction with rootkits, and it gets a lot scarier. And now comes the fun part, a demonstration with uh, Nginx and PHP on a Windows system. Um, the quality on this looks a little bit crappy, and I apologize about that. But uh, in our setup here, we have uh, Nginx version uh, 0.7, 0 0.63, PHP 5.3.0, uh, running in fast CGI mode on port 9000. And in the php.ini file, we have both allow URL f open and allow URL include turned off. So we should not be able to remotely include any files should not be able to. Um, and we have our, ourselves a, a little PHP backdoor, just something very simple that just runs the system command with a get variable. Um, and we have that sitting uh, on a file share named backdoor. So keep that in mind. And with that said, let's actually dive into the cool stuff. So set up a little web application here. So I've got a file upload script and an include script, but we want to make sure we've got a vulnerable, uh, vulnerable situa uh, exploitable situation here. So we verified it's an old version of Nginx by producing an error. And um, we, we go to this include file script and it says, haha, you can't see the source code and doesn't do anything. Um, and truly, we can't see the source code. Um, but let's check and see that this is a Windows system by requesting the 8.3 alias instead. And it works, so we know we're on a Windows system. So knowing the, that we're running an old version of Nginx and that we're, uh, <laughs> that we're on Windows allows us to tack a space on, and all of a sudden it's not a .php, it's a .php space. So yes, we can see the source code now. Um, and we're just including a, a file uh, from a get variable called include file. So that's fun. So um, normally what we would do in this situation is to try to include uh, some, sort of, some sort of PHP script from a website that we control, like maybe on attacker.com or whatever. And um, in this scenario, we get a warning and PHP says, no, I don't want to let you do that. So we decide, well, let's try it a different way. Let's give it a UNC path. Now, if you look in the PHP documentation, it says that these UNC paths are part of the local file system. No, no. So we have remote command execution now. Even though we are including a file remotely, and even though the security options are set to disable this sort of thing. Oops. So let's try, let's try something else. We've got remote code execution, but let's, let's be thorough here. So we've got a file upload script. Let's upload a PHP script and see if it works. It doesn't work. So we're disallowed. We can't, we can't upload anything with a .php extension. Bummer. Let's look at the source and see if we can get around this anyway. So looks like we're blacklisting. Um, anything with an extension of PHP, it just dies and says we're not very nice people, which maybe we're not. Who knows? Um, but we can see our upload directory right about here. So somebody named this expecting that nobody would ever find it. Super secret directory. Um, so not so secret anymore. So we'll take a look at it. Dang, it's forbidden. Wait, wait, wait. Hula! So now, now with our 8.3 alias, we've broken string-based comparison again, and we can see that this guy has accidentally the whole thing. So, so now that we know where the files are going to be, let's try something a little different. Let's try uploading a phpwned file. So we upload it. Yeah, it's fine. So let's check to make sure that it really has been uploaded. Sure enough, it has. And uh, trying to access it normally doesn't work. But what's the first three letters of phpwned? Yeah? 
So now it's, being a, now it's a PHP file. And uh, guess what we've got? Remote command execution. So there we go. Um, how am I doing on time? Uh, two minutes. Minute. Two minutes? OK. I think we got time for questions. OK, so we got, we got some questions. Anybody? Huh? IIS actually, funny enough, won't take 8.3 aliases. Eight, Apache will, but it handles them properly, but it, IIS just won't. Anybody else? What about uh, systems other than XP? Um, well, this, I mean. Yeah, what about systems other than XP? Um, every version of Windows is susceptible to all of these problems. So, uh, except the, the, uh, the buffer overflow and the type command, I don't know about that. That works on XP, I haven't tried it on anything else. It's not really a Windows problem, it's a PHP problem, right? No, it is a Windows problem. Well, it's, it's, it, it's, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's just an undocumented feature. Uh, speaking of which, um, search the MSDN documentation for the, the keywords should avoid sometime. It's great. <laughs> um, that, seriously, like that two of the things in here are like should avoid. But anyway, um, yeah, so I'm sorry, what was your question again? I've got a little bit. Yeah, the, the, the problem is that applications do string-based comparison and don't actually check the file system. So if they're not expecting these mangled versions of the file names, they're not going to handle them properly. Any other questions? Yeah, we're out of time. Out of time? OK. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs> and uh, as I said before, if you can find a, another way to use these techniques, Come see me at the core security booth, win some beer. <laughs>